Okay, you have listened to uh, Dr. Daniel Boyla. Honestly, um, you know, he's come from the point of the law. So what your response to the things he has said so far? Well, a verse of the Bible says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are expedient. I did a video after Nam Dekano was uh, arrested. A mutual friend of my, I and the president called me He's in the US presently. And he said someone forwarded it to him. And he started shouting, Prof, you goofed. This one, you goofed. You shouldn't have done this. This guy killed policemen. He, he, he burnt uh, uh, police stations, this and that. And I said, well, maybe when you calm down, go and listen to what I said once again. Um, Igboho is not just an individual. Igboho is a Yoruba icon. At a time when the security agencies or under President Buhari's command and control failed us, and we were being killed like chicken, uh, Igboho stood in the gap, and the effect of his standing up to be counted is there. And that is what ended uh, the mammoth crowd you see accompany him anytime, anywhere he shows his face. Uh, he doesn't give people money like the fake politicians in Yoruba land do to gather crowd. But because he stands for life, Iboho represents life. He represents peace. Uh, Yoruba people, the right to live without anybody coming to machete them, without anybody coming to kill them, to rape them, destroy their farms, that is what it symbolizes. It symbolizes, uh, you know, life and peace, essentially. And uh, so if you now coming from the other side and then the government that the DSS represents, the government being presided over by President Buhari is seen today as a party in the fray. A typical Yoruba person doesn't see President Buhari as his protector or somebody that is neutral. They see him as being on the side of the Fulani militias, uh, abducting them on highways, major highways, uh, killing them in their farms and destroying their crops. And uh, when they get them arrested, they get released because uh, it is believed it is based on order from Abuja. So Igbo is one person who has called their bluff. That is the way Yoruba people see him. Uh, and that he stood his ground and said, if you dare do this, you are going to incur my wrath. And we actually saw a number of them causing him in that part of the Yoruba land where he went to issue the other, actually voting, voting with their feet. So, but if Abuja sees him, as an irritant, as a secessionist, as a terrorist, as a criminal, they should know that Yoruba people do not see him that way. Professor Shoyinka doesn't see him that way. The Oni of Ife doesn't see him that way. The kings of Ibarakpa, they don't see Igbo as a criminal. Alaki of Egba land, the Aujale of Ijebu land, they don't see Igbo as a criminal or as a terrorist. They may not be talking. The Allah of you for you, I can tell you, is a sad man about what happened to Igbo. So if President Buhari considers this part of the country as uh, uh, people whose voices should be heard, whose views should be respected, whose well-being should be protected, then he's got to be careful with the way he's taking on uh, Igbo and uh, treating him like as if he's a common criminal. I will advise him, like I've done in the video I did after uh, the Kano was arrested, that look, because it appears that until somebody gets violent, President Buhari doesn't seem to think that uh, that person is serious. Uh, because uh, Igbo has not used violence, like I want to reemphasize it. Yoruba people are not using violence. But with what is happening, to an Igbo that did not carry arms. The government is sending a message across that get armed next time, get prepared. 
so that when it's your turn, you'll be able to fight back, you know, and that will not help anybody. I don't think it does any leader any good to be presiding, to be ruling the people that are unhappy, the people that are dissatisfied, that are disgruntled, that do not have trust in you, that sees you as a biased person. Look at the Miyeti Allah. All the time, they come on TV like this, on Chanel's TV, TVC, and they will be talking, you know, with fire. They will be telling you, why will the Fulani not carry AK-47 when people attack them? Why will the Benue state have peace when the governor he, he imposed a ban on uh, open grazing and all that? And, and then nobody arrests them. You know, we've seen Gumi, Shei Gumi, with bandits upon bandits, people who actually carry illegal weapons, scores upon scores of them. I've seen the governor of Katsina, where the president comes from. The video, the photo and the video is all over the social media. Standing and taking picture with uh, uh, so-called bandits, with assault weapons. And we have not seen any of them being arrested. It is Igbo oh, who have not been seen carrying any weapon around. They, they said he said something in one footage. We are talking of those that we saw their faces and we saw the caliber of ammunition, arms and ammunition with them. And nothing happens to them. So the president and his uh, handlers are sending a message across that if you want the government to respect you, to have dialogue with you, get properly harmed. Get properly harmed. Kidnap a lot of, you know, uh, people. Terrorize, you know, invade army barracks, invade uh, in navy, navy barracks, kidnap policemen, kidnap DSS. Then with that, the government will start treating you. They will even begin to give you money. They will begin to think of how do our boy come now? How do we, let's talk now. We are sending somebody to you, uh, we, uh, you know, please don't kill him. Uh, we just want peace. Uh, like the governors in the north are paying bandits, uh, settling, you know, giving them millions of naira. Who told you that is only one section of the country that is capable of doing that kind of thing? If that is what we end them respect, in quote, and we make government to take it easy with them. So the government has got to be very, very careful not to send the wrong signals out because there is nobody that has a monopoly of uh, the, of of uh, getting weapons because Nigeria, a, a, one of my PhD students, he did his paper on small arms proliferation, small and light arms proliferation. The whole of West Africa is awash with small and light arms. In this country today, there is no type of guns based on the the paper I presented. The type of gun that you are looking for that you do, you will not have if you get to be the right people with the right amount of money. So we don't want a situation in Yoruba land. In Yoruba land, we want, don't want Yoruba land to be a theater of war. We don't want a situation where our young men will now become radicalized and start looking for assault weapons to engage government. Because the danger in that kind of thing is that when you have fought the war and it has ended, the guns will be used for other things. We've seen areas where they use guns for politics. And after politics, they use, they started, the boys started using them for armed robbery. And even those people that you saw in Boruno, the Boko Haram, some of the guns they used, they were the guns they were using when they were helping some politicians in the past who they later claimed betrayed them. So the initial guns they used to start the Boko Haram insurgency, I teach at Command and Staff uh, College, Jaji. I teach in some of our military colleges and I research you know, I conduct research with the military. And that's why the center here on campus was endowed by the army. Uh, the Center for Contemporary Security Affairs is a civil military partnership. The initial set of guns used by Boko Haram were not guns bought with any money in their mosque. It's guns that politicians provided them money to buy. When one of them was appointed commissioner for religious affairs, uh, Malan Foy, you know, he was killed alongside Muhammad Yusuf. People have forgotten. So if you 
create a situation where the young people in Yoruba land and a lot of them sophisticated youths who are graduates and are jobless and are angry, start to believe that they need to get arms. And that is when there will be balance of terror. Because right now, what the way they look at the situation is like, they, one side is being terrorized, Yoruba land is being terrorized, and there is the backing of the biased state, a federal government that is biased. In fact, they call the FGN, Fulani government of Nigeria. They don't like saying FGN. What others say in their closest? I from you look like they, I say it from the rooftop. Because I think I, I need to let those who are running the affairs of this country know the truth. I'm not necessarily expressing my personal opinion, but I'm telling you what is going on. There are people that will not say what I'm saying because they are afraid, but I'm telling you the truth. If you send this signal across that unless you guys get armed, you get armed, that is when the federal government will begin. Look at what happened in the Niger Delta. For a long time, there was peaceful protest. Ken Saro, we were never carried a gun, but look at the way that he was killed extrajudicially. Before, you know, there was a kangaroo tribunal, and that was what sowed the seed for radicalization and militancy. The younger generation who saw what was happening, they said, oh, these are not people that you just enter road, they begin the protest, waving uh, Levo, you must go and get properly harmed, and they did. And at the okay. end of the day, what did the government have to do to, to reduce the militancy under President Yaradua? The government itself called for a truce. They've reduced our uh, sale of oil from 2.5 million per day to 800,000 barrels per day. And that is our life wire. So the government more or less went down on its knees and begged, what do you want? President Yaradu have told them that to assure them that at any time they will have cabinet level attention. You will create a whole ministry of Niger Delta. It won't just have the NDDC that you created. And he bought back their guns, billions upon billions of naira. I know this because my student was the chairman implementation committee of the presidential amnesty program, Kinsley Kuku. I taught him in master's class and supervised his, uh, master, uh, his thesis. So I used to go to his office then and I saw what was happening. The federal government actually bought peace in that place with hundreds of billions of naira. So if that is what they want, in Yoruba land, they will get it because they are sending a terrible signal to the youths here. I okay. advise President Buhari that look, do not just start branding people. You are branding Kano terrorists. Okay, fine. He has proved lately that he can be branded terrorists uh, with all that was happening or non government and all that attributed to him. But what about the X Men? You have been told to brand them terrorists long ago. They are this, the, 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 in the global terrorism index, they are considered the fourth deadliest group in the world. I'm talking of terrorist groups, but locally, we are treating them with kids' glove. So, what about those ones? So, Yoruba land during the Civil War was the pillar upon which the unity of this country stood. Okay, Prof. By let's. The time uh... you are your balance to go the way of militancy, then the country is, it is over. President okay. Mary, the earlier he embraces dialogue, knowing that it is not every, every he, he, he does not see a target in every problem that will require shooting a gun. <coughs> That's the way he's looking at things. Every problem okay. is a target. So, Prof, so let's, and then let's, gone let's, is what will solve the problem. The okay. earlier he starts reaching out making overshows and talking to people and seeking alternative ways like Obasanjo, what Obasanjo calls stick and carrot approach, the better for everybody. Okay, Prof, thank you. Very much. Let's...